Dr. Perlmutter, welcome to the summit. Well, Dr. Jockers, thank you for having me. Good to see you again. Absolutely. Well, I always enjoy talking with you. You're a wealth of knowledge. And, you know, we're really in your niche topic here, which is neurodegenerative conditions. Can you talk about them? And obviously, you you were in pra private practice seeing people for many years. And can you talk about the rise in neurodegenerative conditions as well over the years? Sure. So, you know, as it relates to, I think the one people are most fearful of, and that is Alzheimer's disease, uh, you know, the rates of Alzheimer's disease are increasing fairly dramatically. We're approaching uh, 6 million uh, pe people diagnosed in the United States right now. And it's not just because our population is aging, it's even beyond that. And, you know, we're seeing uh, this actually being diagnosed in younger and younger individuals. So it's really quite clear, especially when you look at the research that does uh, compares of uh, two variables like uh, diabetes or obesity or inflammatory markers and risk for developing uh, Alzheimer's, we really see a lot of correlation there that uh, explains perhaps what is going on on the one hand. And on the other hand, I think offers us up some really powerful interventions uh, that can be substantiated in terms of why we're doing, why we are recommending what we recommend, at least, um, based upon these relationships. And now we know mechanistically, we can describe some pretty powerful relationships between uh, inflammation, for example, and risk uh, for Alzheimer's disease. And this isn't new. Uh, and we've known about this actually for quite some time. Researchers 30 years ago uh, collected blood samples on individuals and then followed these individuals for, for 24 years and uh, this is um, a group of 1,600 patients, or rather uh, individuals, uh, had their blood looked at, and they created what is called an inflammatory index. And what does that mean? Uh, they looked at a variety of markers of inflammation back then, three decades ago, uh, things like fibrinogen, von Willebrand's factor, white blood cell count. We don't really use them much today, or others. Mm -hmm. But these are markers of inflammation. They follow these people for 26 years. And what did they find? That there was a dramatic correlation between having elevation of these inflammatory markers three decades ago and risk today of having a smaller brain and a reduction in memory. So it tells us a couple of things. First, that inflammation is really important. Yeah as measured by those markers. Today, we use other markers, of course. But it also tells us that what happens uh, today may impact how your brain is decades from now. So it's not really good enough to say, uh, I'm going to wait until I forget all of my grandchildren's names, or you know, I'm gonna, for the 10th time, ask somebody, what is my Wi-Fi pass passcode, or whatever it is, uh, you know, when it gets to the point that you're walking in the room and forgetting why you went there so many times, you say, you know, I think I'll see a doctor at this point. Guess what? There's nothing really dramatic that she or he is going to be able to do at that point to really turn it around. Although we do see that there is some effectiveness of some, you know, aggressive lifestyle uh, choices. We know that there's no medication, which is what I'm getting at, that yeah. will help this individual. Interestingly, um, in 2018, in our most well-respected neurology journal called Neurology, <laughs> put out by the American Board of Neurology, uh, they looked at 14 different possible interventions that could be utilized to help prevent somebody from going from what is called MCI, mild cognitive impairment, into full-blown Alzheimer's. Drugs like uh, Namenda, Memantine, uh, cholinesterase inhibiting drugs like Dinepazil, Aricept. And they ended up with only one recommendation. They made this recommendation to every neurologist who reads the journal, hopefully every neurologist in America. And their recommendation, the most powerful thing, in fact, the only thing that was scientifically proven to reduce your risk of going from mild cognitive impairment into full-blown dementia was something called exercise. And that was published in the our journal. I couldn't believe it. Up toe-to-toe -to -toe against all these multi-million dollar drugs, the only thing that worked was exercise. Now, um, 
a lifestyle choice. So we've got to do everything we can right now. So we don't even get to that place. You know, prevention yeah. is really what it's all about because, you know, understand that we have no powerful pharmaceutical intervention whatsoever that's going to turn this around once things really become uh, dysfunctional. Well, that's a really important thing to understand. What you're saying is that Alzheimer's disease is something that it's not like we just get it all of a sudden. We don't wake up one day with it when we're 65 years old. It's something we start developing early in life. I mean, it could be as early as even in our you know childhood years and teens, we start the process of developing this. And it's a long-term process, but there are things we can do today. We shouldn't wait until, you know, again, we're 65 and now we've got full-blown symptoms because unfortunately, conventional medicine, they don't have a silver bullet for this, but there are things we can be doing today to help prevent that. And that's a really empowering message. So what are some of the root cause factors too that you're seeing at the root of the development of brain inflammation? You know, hard to say which comes first. Uh, is obesity, for example, the root cause factor or what are the lifestyle choices that end up manifesting as obesity? And I choose that because it, I think it, it, uh, it plays very uh, handily into our notion as to when people should begin thinking about adopting a, a brain-proofing kind of program. Uh, one study published in the journal, again, Neurology, back in 2008, looked at a group of over 6,000 people, followed them for 36 years. At the beginning of the time when they followed this group, they did a very, very um, sophisticated test. And what it involved was they measured how big was their belly. Hmm. And they followed these individuals uh, for 36 years, and they found that those people 36 years ago who had a big belly. Like a waist size a, measurement? Is that oh, what they did? Pardon me? Was it a waist size measurement or was it? It was BMI? a waist size measurement. Yeah, waist size. Exactly. Yeah. Well, basically waist to hip ratio. Yeah, yeah. And they found that those individuals had a big belly 36 years ago, had a three-fold increased risk for developing hmm. dementia, a disease for which there is no treatment. Right. The point I'm trying to make is that possibly one of the most powerful screening tools available in modern science to determine your risk for future development of dementia is a tape measure. Hmm. Think about that. And there's all these efforts uh, underway to find a blood marker for Alzheimer's. Certainly, uh, that'd be great. A blood marker for Alzheimer's risk. Well, there isn't one yet, but we know that a tape measure can do the job. We do know there's a very powerful relationship between inflammatory markers, interleukin-6, uh, interleukin-1-beta, tumor necrosis factor alpha, uh, and risk for downstream uh, development of Alzheimer's. And certainly even C-reactive protein is related. Something even more banal would be blood sugar and uh, hemoglobin A1C. Mm -hmm. Both relate directly and dramatically to risk of dementia. Study published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2017, looked at a group of, I believe, 2,300 non-demented individuals followed them for 6.7 years. And the only test they did at the beginning of the study was their blood sugar, fasting blood sugar. We all have had that. Everybody goes to the doctor. That's part of the blood work that you get every year. And they found that people who had elevation of their blood sugar, even to 105 and 110, had an increased risk of dementia after about seven years. So what does it tell us? It tells us that maybe we ought to take better control of our blood sugar because that's powerfully related. We know that blood sugar, when it's elevated, causes what's called insulin resistance to happen. Mm. The brain needs to have functioning insulin to power itself, to allow blood sugar to get into the cells. The brain needs to have insulin available in a working fashion to allow the brain during times of starvation to use what are called ketones. We know that insulin is a trophic hormone in the brain as well, uh, nurturing the delicate brain neurons. So it says to us that we darn well better get our blood sugar under control today because down the line, when it's not under control, inflammation markers go up, our belly will get big, and our blood sugar will continue to rise. I've given you literature citations for all three. 
relating to increased risk for a disease for which there is no pharmaceutical treatment. So it means eating in a way that keeps your blood sugar under control. It means getting enough restorative sleep it has a direct effect on inflammation, a direct effect on blood sugar control. It means exercising has a direct effect on inflammation, has a direct effect on AMP kinase and therefore blood sugar control. So these are lifestyle factors that are hugely valuable to each and every one of us today. As John Kennedy said, the time to fix the roof is when the sun is shining. You know, so for people who are at all concerned about uh, becoming demented, and that will be if you live to be age 85, 50% of people at 85 be, are demented. Uh, I, I'm hopeful wow. to reach 85, got 20 years to go. Uh, and I have a family history of Alzheimer's. So I'm doing what I can, yeah. uh, measuring my blood sugar uh, with a continuous glucose monitor. I can tell you my blood sugar at any given moment. It tells me how do I respond to certain things in my diet? Is white rice good or bad for me? Mm. Each of your viewers would want to know. Uh, are almonds a good choice? Mangoes, strawberries, white rice, what's good for your individual blood sugar? You can know that now by getting mm. a CGM, a continuous glucose monitor. You can know what your heart rate is doing during exercise. Are you targeting a heart rate and, and achieving that heart rate by wearing a wearable device that will tell you your heart rate? You can determine the quality of your sleep and the quantity of your sleep by a wearable device, uh, a specific ring called an aura ring right. is the one I use. And we'll tell you not just how long did you sleep, but was it good? Was it restorative? Yeah. Because if it's not, then you're affecting your blood sugar, you're increasing inflammation in your body, and you're setting yourself up not just for Alzheimer's, but for diabetes, obesity, coronary artery disease, and even cancer. Those are the major causes of mm. death on planet Earth even right now in the midst of a pandemic, the number one cause of death on our planet are the chronic degenerative conditions over which our lifestyle choices have huge influence. It's a big message. 